trying to remember. I think I talked about this uh, sometime this year. It must have been before I came here. But you remember that Alice in Wonderland is a children's story. If you remember or recall it in detail, you probably remember that it's not a very pleasant children's story. I mean, Alice falls through a looking glass and down to a long, dark place. And she's all alone, and she faces some very scary and confusing circumstances. The difficulties Alice faced were fantasy. Most of us will never be confronted with a Cheshire cat spouting riddles with a toothy grin. I mean, who understands cats anyway, but... Uh, or a nasty queen of hearts shouting, off with their heads! I mean, most of us will never face that kind of problem. But we're familiar, I think, with the problem of the disconcerting things that happen in life. The wonder in Wonderland is that same aloneness and desolation I think we feel at such times. Think World Trade Center. Think the current frightening experiences of just about anybody be, being unsafe from the rampage of a deranged shooter. Columbine, Uvalde, Texas, Raleigh, North Carolina this week, and other massacres. They're not necessarily in our thoughts every day, every moment of the day, but in times of common tragedy, what do we do? We recognize the burden of Wonderland all too well. It keeps coming back. If I believed in haunting, I would have to say haunting us. All through Alice's adventure, by the way, that doesn't mean I don't believe in the spirit world. I do believe in the spirit world. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing up here. I'd be out drunk this morning. Truthfully. You know, if there's no such thing as a spirit world, then God doesn't have a Holy Spirit. If there's no such thing as a spirit world, then there's no such thing as the devil and demons. Because that's what the scripture says. If there is no such thing, then, my friends, we are of all, of all people, as Paul said, most miserable. All through Alice's adventure, she was looking for what? She was looking for a direction. She was looking for a road to travel so she could get back to where it was normal. Have you ever thought about that the past couple of years with COVID? Have you ever heard the phrase, get back to normal? Well, that's what Alice was looking like, uh, looking for. Kind of like Dorothy in the Land of Oz. There's uh, the anticipation of rest and home if we can just get where we're going. And I think that's exactly how most of us read this passage when Jesus said, come on, come to me, and I'll give you rest. We're looking for getting back to normal. The problem is that normal is so abnormal in God's kingdom that we miss the whole point. Comfort and peace can be in short supply when you need it the most. There are so many experiences of life that cause us to cry out, what? I just don't understand. You understand mass shootings? Do you understand people being so angry over the tiniest thing these days? Do you understand all of the fur, the furor that goes on? I mean, politics is bad enough, but when it's road rage and when it's next door neighbor, it's next door neighbor and family members. One preacher said this about the inner need for peace, and I quote, Strained by the very mad pace of our daily outer burdens, we are further strained by an inward uneasiness. Because we have hints that there is a way of life vastly different, vastly richer and deeper than all this hurried existence, a life of unhurried serenity and peace and power, and then he ends it this way. If only. Sounds like Alice in Wonderland. Sounds like Dorothy clicking her heels three times. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. He said, if only we could slip over into that center. We'd be back to normal, right? Have you been there? Have you ever been there? 
Everybody who has sensed that need for serenity has been at that place where rest seems like it'll just never come again. As if the burden is all we've ever known. Sometimes the pressures of life just awaken us in the middle of the night. Life can be really hard, can't it? In our text, in Matthew chapter 11, we meet Jesus swimming, literally, in a culture of incredible opposition. The pressure was absolutely intense. You read all the background on Matthew chapter 11 and the chapters that go before that. Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. Blessed are you. Oh, how happy are you when? And that leads up to the beginning of the confrontations that Jesus had. Pressure was such an intense thing in those days for the Lord. John the Baptist, his cousin, questioned him. Are you the one? Are you really the one? Or should we look for somebody else? Didn't seem to be a great backer of Jesus, the coming Lord, did really. The crowds were dwindling. Jesus' hometown people in the Galilean cities were not responding even to the great miracles that Jesus was doing. And the Pharisees, bless their political hearts, were turning up the heat with all sorts of accusations. And in the middle of the heat of battle, we find Jesus not only serene, but he is filled with a calm and a peace, just like you'd imagine a man just sitting there at home in his recliner with his remote in his head. I mean, that's the, that's the sign of truth. <coughs> Jesus was the bedrock of peace in a culture in turmoil, and he held out his hands, and he said, come on, you can have that too. Come unto me. That's what I'll give you. Peace in the midst of all this turmoil. What I'd like for us to do is notice two things that happen when you take Jesus up on that offer. When he says to us, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavily laden, carrying those burdens, weary, worn down. You come unto me and I will give you rest. I want you to notice two things that happen. First, is you get that rest when the burdens are overwhelming. In the middle of a world that was gone mad with the Roman emperors tightening all the screws on the Jewish people, the local cheating tax collectors like Matthew who wrote our text this morning, rampant poverty and disease, we don't have any of that, do we? and no relief in sight. Did it seem in the middle of COVID that we would ever get rid of those masks? <laughs> Jesus turns to the crowd of anxious and haggard and overburdened and worn out people and he offers that deal. Come unto me, you weary, burdened people, and I'll give you rest. Weariness, burdens. Does that sound familiar at all? Don't get me wrong. This sermon is not a downer. At least the next part of the sermon is instant. Life is wonderful. I'm with Jimmy Stewart. It's a wonderful life. But it does take its toll, doesn't it? <clears throat> I read about a woman who telephoned a friend and asked how she was feeling. And the woman on the other end of the line said, Terrible. My head's splitting. My back and legs are killing me. The house is a mess. The kids are driving me up a wall. Very sympathetically, the caller said, well, you listen, go and lie down. I'll come over and I'll, I'll cook and I'll cook lunch for you. I'll clean up the house and I'll take care of the children while you lay down and get some rest. All in favor, say amen. Mm -hmm. She said, by the way, how's, how's your husband Sam? And she, the woman said, my husband's name isn't Sam. And the woman said, oh my goodness, I called the wrong number. <laughs> There's a long pause. <laughs> and then the woman said, but you are still coming over, right? <laughs> Can you identify? <clears throat> Even though life's burdens and sorrows and hard times are part of living, Jesus' offer to us is come. And he's going to do something about it. 
See, that's an invitation to come close to him, to connect with him, so that the closer we come to Jesus, the less our burdens can hold us down. Psalm 68 and verse 19 says, Praise be to the Lord, to God our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. Now you say, I like the sound of that. Somebody that's going to shoulder my burdens. It's kind of like the old hymn I learned as a child. Cast your care on Jesus today. Leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. That last word is the most important word of that hymn, near. But unfortunately, sometimes we don't get that rest because Jesus isn't near. And guess what? If he's not near, who was it that moved? Was it him or was it us? I think certainly as a nation, we could say our nation has moved away. He's not as near to this nation as he used to be, right? This means right, and this means you're wrong. <laughs> Amen? Without a vital connection to Jesus, there's not going to be any intimate personal fellowship. And so any kind of rest that we think we're going to get would be a fraud, be an invitation. It's kind of like me fixing things around the house. I can take a shot at it, but, you know, it doesn't work out very well. We had a toaster one time that provided a lot of entertainment rather than toast. <laughs> it had one of these wires that didn't connect just right, and so the sparks were like Disney's light parade. Uh, electricity knows when you are not its master. I do have a lot of respect for electricity. I have a son-in-law, Jennifer's husband, who is an electrician, and... Uh, I mean, he's a sophisticated electrician. He's a step above, master, if you will. But um, he has told me if he ever catches me near anything electrical again, he's going to have my hide. <laughs> when I fixed that toaster, it became something like out of a horror movie. The, the, the family calls everything I fixed, Dad Fixed. Whenever Dad fixes it, you know, it's uh, sure to come unglued, undone, unholy. Uh, it's like that, though, with the Christians walk with the Master. Without a good connection, without staying near to Him, we become short-circuited. There's no power. Our rest becomes a fraud and a fake. And it's like me with toasters, anything else, mechanical or electrical, there's no fixing it without a miracle. You cannot fix your relationship to the creator of all things with a self-help course, therapy, meditation, or medication. Those things are not something I'm against. I mean, self-help courses are fine. Therapy is great. Meditation is needed. You need quiet times. Medication is needed. Tom and I are having a running <laughs> battle on who takes more pills every single day. You know, I mean, you know, when you get a little bit older, you get a, this goes wrong, that goes wrong. What's the doctor say? Well, I'm going to write you a prescription. And, you know, that, that stuff adds up. Look at me, I'm preaching to the choir, right? There is no get out of jail free card if you're not close to Jesus. For that, there's only bowing before his throne for mercy. When we come to Christ, we offer him our past life. Lord, I've sinned. You're the Savior. We place the sinful things that we've done on the altar. That's why at the end of every service you'll hear me say, this altar is open and you can come. You can cast all of your care on Jesus because he cares for you. We ask for his power to overcome those same temptations and failings in the future. The rest that God gives you in exchange for that offering of yourself up. That's what the deal is. Jesus said, come unto me, all you labor and heavily laden, I'll give you rest for your soul. When you need it the most. It's not the physical kind of rest, although that might be a part of it, might be a side blessing. It's rest for your soul that you're really hungry after. 
you don't understand what's going on around you, or you see it and you have ideas about it, you can't figure out why people would act that way. Do those things. Why the world is going down, down, down. Why there's so much tragedy. There's no rest inside when that's the condition. Our son Jason was a first sergeant, sergeant first class in Mosul, Iraq. On his second tour, I think it was, he, had, he uh, did four tours in all over there. And um, on this second tour in Mosul, he had been there six months. And uh, after dealing with the stress of serving in a war zone for half a year, his superior said, you go take a rest. R&R &R is what they call it. If you've been in the military, you know that term. R&R &R was a plane ride to Germany in two weeks with his wife and daughters. It was refreshing. But then he went back to complete the year that he was sent over there to do. Now, that's pretty standard operation in the military. I did the same thing. Met that lady in Hawaii. We chose a place where we never got to honeymoon, but... Uh, there it was. It was six months after we married. We married, and what was it, nine days later, I went to Vietnam. And so six months later, we met in Hawaii. It was a wonderful thing. That kind of a thing is refreshing. But what comes after it? You go right back to the same place, right? This is the rest that Jesus promises. Not a freedom from work, or a freedom from problems, a freedom for the question marks of life, but an oasis when you need it. What is the one thing somebody who's dying of thirst wants to see in the desert? An oasis. He wants to see those trees. He wants to see that little puddle of water there. Why? Because he knows he'll die without it. That's the rest that Jesus is talking about. A good, solid connection demands that we daily put our life in His control by putting aside the love of sin. That's what makes a good connection. We give Him our sin, and in return, He gives our soul rest. In the process, our burdens get lifted by the Prince of Calvary. That's the first thing that happens when you take Him up on that deal that He offers you to come and receive rest. A second thing that happens is you're, you wind up getting balance in your life. You know, you can walk a long way as long as you can keep your balance. Isn't that true? Matthew chapter 11, verse 29 and 30, the last two verses of our text, Jesus says, take my yoke on you. What is a yoke? It's what the animals, you put the animals in and they pull the plow, right? You know what we're talking about here. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The burden is where the balance comes in. We were taking those flood buckets out from the boiler room a few weeks ago. And uh, I picked up as many as I could carry, but I made sure I had the same amount on this side as I had on this side because I knew, I, you know, if we, those things are heavy. When If you're going to try to carry just one side, I need it to be balanced. And that's what Jesus promises us. He balance is a matter of knowing and living by the right principles, right priorities. For the believer, there's only one balanced priority. It goes something like this. Whatever Jesus wants is what I want. That's the balance in life. Well, that's how you achieve balance. Jesus says, take his yoke and learn by following in his footsteps. There is at least some apocryphal evidence that Jesus, the carpenter, made some of the best yokes in Galilee. A good yoke is light. It doesn't chafe when you work, and it's balanced so that the major load of the work is borne by the lead animal. In this case, that's Jesus. Jesus' footsteps were balanced. There were times of <coughs> prayer that were balanced by times to laugh when the children came to it. You know, uh, churches that I've served, uh, you know, I've done at times a children's sermon. And you know, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, more intimidating at times than to have children ask you questions on Sunday morning, you know. 
I'll tell you about some of those sometime. But, uh, but it is a wonderful time because you see those faces looking at you, those glad eyes, and the happy expressions, and the puzzled look when they don't understand a thing that you're saying. You know? uh, I used to get that a lot. There was a time in Jesus' life to heal, but it was also balanced by a time to swing the whip in the temple. There was a time to eat, but there was also a balance of a time to fast for 40 days. So this is the balance that a Christian seeks as well. Taking the yoke of Christ means joining with Jesus. It means understanding that in his yoke, who's the leader? Who do you suppose? Is it you or is it Jesus? He's the one who's taking on the majority of the work. That's why he says to you, come unto me, all you that labor and are laden, and I will give you rest for your soul. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. He is the leader. We serve giving ourselves to Christ. We allow him to take control. And what happens is he lifts the burden off of our shoulder and puts it on his. We can still serve him, but it doesn't have to be in our strength because he's the one that's pulling the major part of the role, of, of, of the loom. We serve putting ourselves in that yoke, a place where he bears the leader's weight. So all of that to say this, watch. What do we do about it? What do we do about all the stuff that's happening? The fact that we want to serve Christ, we want to be his, we want to do what's right. How shall we live our lives in light of all of this? How shall we apply the understanding that coming close to Jesus means having our burden lifted, but that coming close to Jesus means a balanced life? I would say the conclusion is that we have to spend our lives coming close, connecting with Jesus. We need to learn to take the time to put on the gentle yoke. We have to accept the leadership of he who is the lead animal, our master. Today, a lot of us feel, perhaps like Alice, we've fallen down through the looking glass, and we have muddled in trials and temptations on every hand, a bill that's bigger than your income, a relationship that just won't work, or some mountain to climb, getting bigger each day, maybe. Whatever frenzy the world throws at you, I want you to know this. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. And when you come close, you're going to find out, as the songwriter put it, there's rest along the weary way. You got your little insert in front of you. Take a look at that first stanza. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand, the shadow of a mighty rock in the weary land. A home within the wilderness. Is our world a wilderness these days? As civilized as this whole world is becoming, it's becoming more wilderness spiritually. From the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the day. Then skip down to the last verse, the third verse. I take, O cross, thy shadow. That's what I was talking about where the altar is concerned, where we surrender ourselves. I take the shadow of the cross for my abiding place. I want to stay under the shadow of the cross. I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face. Content to let the world go by, to know no gain nor loss. My sinful self, my only shame. My glory, all the cross. Folks, that is where rest for your souls is found, beneath the cross of Jesus. And that is where your glory will also be found one day. You know, when I joked about that bell and the graveyard stirring because of the loudness of it, one day there is going to be a beautiful sound from heaven that's going to be much louder than that. It's going to be so loud, it's going to wake up the dead. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then those who remain will be caught up to be with him forever in the sky. I dare you. No. No, I don't dare you. I double dog dare you. <laughs> Take this home. Pray <coughs> all week long. Wherever you get alone to be with Jesus,
Jesus, whether it's nighttime, middle of the night, early morning, lunch break, pray this prayer. Pray this, the three stanzas of this prayer. And see if somewhere along the line, God doesn't 